2,000 years ago, God came to earth. 2,000 years ago, God came to earth. And he came to earth on a rescue mission to save the world. Save the world, you say. From what? From aliens? From increasing gas prices? Lord, come quickly. From Godzilla? What did he come to save the world from? Here's the answer. Sin. God came from heaven to earth to save us from sin and hell. He came, but, but he wasn't welcome by the very people that he created. He was rejected and suffered unlike anyone who has ever lived in the history of forever. God came to visit, but we shut the door right in his face. No, thank you, we said. But he knew this, and he did it all anyways. God sent his son Jesus to our rescue. And Jesus suffered, and he suffered for us. Jesus faced bitter circumstances, but God still had a plan through it all. A plan that would give us a hope to hold on to in our bitter circumstances. Father, we come before you tonight. God, thank you for this message. Thank you for the lives that will be changed tonight. Thank you for the souls that will be redirected from hell to heaven. We pray that you teach us through your life here on earth. As bitter as it was, boy, what a sweet outcome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Growing up skateboarding, ah, I had a lot of, a lot of bitter circumstances, a lot of injuries, torn skin, bruised elbows, black eyes, muscle tears, broken teeth, you name it. A lot of injuries. And I, I was 16, I remember the day like it was yesterday, and I'm 25 now. I'm getting old. It's crazy. But I was 16. I remember I had really long hair, and I was like, you know, I'd love to whip it around. And uh, I had just finished school for the summer. And I had a brand new skateboard. I was stoked. I actually came here to this park to skate. And it was beautiful, I remember. And, and I was skating, having a blast. And, and I tried something, and I made a mistake. Something that I'd always done. I made a mistake. You know what happened? I fell from six feet up, flat on my face. <laughs> Here's what happened. I bit straight through my tongue, knocked my front tooth in half. I pushed my bottom four teeth four millimeters back into my skull. Pushed my top four four millimeters back into my skull. As soon as it happened, I looked on the ground, blood everywhere. And I tried to feel my teeth because I knew I hit them. And I, I tried to feel my teeth, and I'm rubbing my, my tongue on my teeth, and my tongue is all torn up, and, and, I, and I had no idea, but I felt nothing. I felt pieces, and I thought, my teeth are gone. <laughs> I'm not my teeth, and I'm screaming, my teeth! My teeth! You know, I'm 16, and I'm like, this is terrible. What a start to summer break. What a start to summer break. It's crazy because... The thing about skateboarding, or really anything, is that you don't really choose the pain, do you? No one says, you know what, brother, I'm going to just, I'm going to go shatter my pelvis today. Hallelujah, sounds great. I didn't say, I'm going to go break my face. You know, I prayed about it. I just feel at peace. You know, I'm just going to, I'm going to go for it. <laughs> no one chooses the pain. Amen? Amen. It's crazy. Because here in, in the world, especially in America, people choose to stay away from pain at all costs. And according to a recent survey, check this out, roughly 40% of Americans are on painkillers. The total revenue of the pharmaceutical industry is it's crazy. The total revenue currently globally is $1.5 trillion dollars. People want to do everything they possibly can to stay away from pain. No one likes it. I don't like pain. It sucks. It's the worst. No one chooses to endure it, to suffer, to taste pain in full. No one except Jesus. He suffered fully. And boy, he suffered in many ways. His beautiful, painful plan to rescue the world was not shy of pain and suffering, but it was actually full of pain and suffering. He suffered for us in three ways. And those ways will help us understand the reality of, of why he did what he did. 
and understand that the pain he endured was all for our second chances. The first thing you guys can write down, the first thing that we need to know about Jesus' suffering was that, number one, his suffering was emotional. His suffering was emotional. Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? Have you ever felt like, man, ow, there's a, a knife in my back. Wow. Has anyone ever felt like betrayed by a friend, like you got stabbed in the back, like someone, you know, did something to, to lose your trust or they said one thing and then did something secretly behind your back? You, you've maybe felt betrayal. Jesus felt it. Jesus was betrayed by one of his closest friends. Judas Iscariot, he was one of Jesus' followers. And he'd been with Jesus for about three years, and, you know, their ministry, it's great. They're saving people, healing, going around, casting out demons. I mean, changing the world. Judas was one of the 12 close followers of Jesus Christ. He saw the trueness, the reality of God face to face. But Judas had evil in his heart. He said one thing and lived another way, and he went secretly behind the disciples secretly behind Jesus' back and, and went with the religious leaders and said, hey, you know, this Jesus guy, I know you really hate him because he says that he's God and, and you think that that's not true. And so, you know, here, here's what I'm going to do. It, how much will you give me if I hand him over to you? And they say, oh, well, Judas, we'll, we'll give you 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver for God. 30 pieces of silver in those days was the price of a common slave. The modern day equivalent is about 3,500 bucks. I don't know if it's really worth. Some of you are like, oh, it's a lot more money than I got. <laughs> but the reality is, is Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The New Testament describes how, how Judas took the soldiers to this garden. It was the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and here Jesus was praying on this night 2,000 years ago, Jesus and his disciples had spent some time in an upper room praying, and, and Jesus reveals that he's the only way and the truth and the life, and he's the true vine, and, and he, he washes the feet, and then, and then they you know, take communion. They're spending this last night together. Then they go to this garden to pray, and Jesus, he's there praying. And boy, it's a rough night. It's a very bitter night for God. So, so Judas takes the soldiers that he had agreed for 30 pieces of silver to, to betray Jesus to, and he, and he takes them to this garden. And the Bible says that, that Judas then kissed Jesus to identify him as the one. Here's the crazy thing. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, but he didn't try to stop him. Jesus knew that, that Judas had, had this, this scheme, this evil plan, but, but Jesus didn't try and stop him. Here, here's the rule. God's plan is far greater than man's plan. Man plans evil, but God plans good, and God always wins, period. God always wins. End of discussion. No contest. Hits, he's the victor, man. He's done. Genesis 50, 20 says, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Jesus knew that he would be stabbed in the back, that, that he knew that the emotional pain of being betrayed, of, of being abandoned in that garden, he knew the rejection. He knew that his disciples, the other 11 who were there with him, would run away, that the, the soldiers would come and arrest Jesus. And, and he knew that, and he suffered for a plan. Jesus knew the plan. He always knew what Jesus would do, but he always loved Judas. Jesus always knew what Judas would do, but he still always loved Judas. Do we still love people, even though they try and hurt us? Do we still love people, even though they are prone to fail us? That, that maybe, man, we, we put up these walls to fight against that hurt. Here's a thought. What if we could love people the way Jesus loved Judas? What if we could love the way that Jesus loved Judas without reservation, without walls? What if we could love those that stab us in the back? That's tough. I'll be honest. I'm just like, I don't want to love you. You just stab me in the back. 
But here's the deal. You can ask, you know, why, 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 God, why didn't you stop Judas? Like, you knew this. You, you mean you chose him to follow you three years ago. Why didn't you, why did you choose him if you knew this was going to happen? Because he had a plan. Jesus had a plan. Fulfilling the mission was worth enduring every moment of pain. Fulfilling that, that mission to rescue, to save the world, was worth it to God. So that no matter the pain, no matter the emotional suffering, no matter the betrayal, the abandonment, the rejection, it was worth it to him. It was worth it to him. In that garden, while his friends slept, Jesus underwent severe emotional suffering. Before those soldiers showed up, Jesus underwent a lot, a lot of suffering. He says in Matthew 26, 38, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He cries out to his father in heaven in Matthew 26, 42, my father, if it is possible, let this cup be taken from me. But it's not my will, but it's your will that be done. Through all his emotional suffering, he still turns to God. He says, your plan, not mine. Your plan. Not mine. Can we say the same? God, no, no matter what bitterness I'm going through, it's your plan. It's, it's not mine. And I have to trust that your, your crazy, extravagant, beautiful, painful plan is a part of, of my story for, for me to, to tell people and to know that there's a God in heaven that loves me enough to go through this for me. He says, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Friends, the only way for us to go to the Father is for Jesus to go to the cross. The only way for us to go to the Father in heaven is for Jesus to go to the cross. That's the only way, and Jesus knew it. But you can sense his humanity here as he's questioning. He's like, God, this, I know what's going to happen to me. And, and he starts in the garden. He gets so, so uh, filled with anguish and, and uh, you know, suffering that, that his, his blood vessels in his head burst. And he starts to sweat blood. He's in such extreme anguish knowing what he's going to endure that he says, Father, man, like, I know that this is the will, but is there, there's any other way. The only way for you to get to the Father. It's for Jesus to go to the cross. Jesus is then arrested in that garden, and he's taken before the religious leaders who hated Jesus. They mocked him. They made fun of him. They put him down. They wanted him dead. Has anyone ever made fun of you? I'm raising my hand. Look at this. How many of you have been made fun of? It sucks. It's the worst. I hate it. Why do people put other people down? You know, you've heard it said that maybe hurting people hurt people. But we got to say, man, hurting people help people. If you're hurting tonight, I'm so glad you're here. I'm hurting too. We're in the same boat. But we need to help. We need to share with the world that there's a God who did this crazy plan that we're talking about. That he offers second chances and so much more. Has anyone ever bullied you, mocked you, put you down, told you to go die. People have told you this. Words hurt, man. But here's the deal. I I've been there, and Jesus has been there, and he knows your pain. Jesus knows your pain. Jesus relates to you in more ways than you even know. The second thing we need to know about Jesus' suffering was that his suffering was physical. His suffering was physical. So Jesus is taken before the religious leaders, and they're mocking him and, and putting him down and, and, and uh, telling him, you know, you're, you're going to die. I mean, you're, you've, you're blasphemous. You know, you're going against God. You're saying that you are God. Like, that's blasphemy. So you need to die. I mean, you need to get away. But you need blah, blah, blah. Like, putting him down. Mocking him. They then take Jesus before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And they put him in front of a crowd like this, and they say, hey, uh, People, Jews, well, what do you want with this man? And Pilate, the governor, knew that, that he was able to release a criminal in exchange for another. So there's this guy, his name's Barabbas. He's a terrible dude. He's a crook, a murderer, a thug. He's killed people. He deserves to be there. 
And the people start shouting, give us Barabbas. Yeah, give us Barabbas. We don't like Jesus. Take him away, kill him, crucify him. We want Barabbas. See, Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. But he lets the crowd dictate his decision. So what does he do? He lets this man who deserves to be in those chains, who deserves to go to the cross, Barabbas, he lets him free. And in exchange, this man, Jesus, beautiful, perfect Jesus, who's only come to heal, who's only come to save, who's only come to, to, to resurrect dead lives. He, he's put in chains, and the man who, who deserves to be there is, is set free. And the man who doesn't deserve to be there is taken in. The same people who were days earlier <laughs> laying down palms as Jesus rode into this city saying, Messiah, Messiah, are now saying, crucify, crucify. Days earlier, Jesus is being praised. Now he's being condemned to death. Pilate lets the truth drown out. He lets the, the, the truth get drowned out with lies, and the people are shouting to him, man, like, give, give us Barabbas, and his decision is dictated by the people's choice, the people's vote. So Jesus is taken away, and he, he's flogged. And the Romans, they'd occupied Jerusalem, they'd occupied Judea, part of modern-day Israel. And the, the Romans were, were pros at torture, they had perfected crucifixion. They had perfected torturing criminals. And so they, they get a cat of nine tails. And it was this whip that had nine strands. And they would put bone and glass and, and pieces of, uh, of sharp objects into the, the, the strands. And you know what they did? They tied Jesus to a pole and they, they beat him. This innocent man taken in, beaten. And the Bible says in Isaiah, Isaiah 52, 14, the, the prophet Isaiah said 700 years earlier, prophesying about this event, says that Jesus, the Messiah, would be beaten so badly that he would be disfigured beyond that of any man and beyond human likeness. Jesus is taken. He's beaten. He's unrecognizable. He's beaten so badly that people can't even recognize him. His flesh, his back is torn open. He has bone exposed. He's bleeding. This innocent man is taken and beaten. And you know what happens next is Pilate, he, he brings them out before the people. And before he, he does that, some Roman soldiers come and they put a purple robe over Jesus, over his, his cut, his bloody open wounds. They put a purple robe signifying, you know, kingdom and, and being a, a part of royalty. And they put this crown of thorns on his head. And they kick it into his skull, and there's blood, and they say, all hail, king of the Jews. And they slap him in the face. They say, yeah, king of the Jews. Jesus, beaten, tortured, bloody, bruised, comes back before the people. And Pilate says, well, what should we do with this man? You know what the people shout even louder? Crucify! Crucify him. We don't want him. He's not our king. You know, we only are loyal to Caesar, they say. Crucify him. And so Pilate gets drowned out with the noise of the crowd, and he says, you know what, I'm going to wash my hands. You know, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And so he sends Jesus away. And during this whole time, Jesus, standing, I can see it, standing there, blood, the wounds, crown of thorns, and he's just thinking. I have a plan. I have a plan for this pain. There's a, a purpose for this pain. Jesus came to the world with full knowledge of what was awaiting him. The emotional suffering, the physical suffering, pure, raw, terrible pain. There's a purpose for the pain. Wherever you're at in life, know that there's a purpose for your pain. So Pilate gives the word. Jesus is led away like a sheep being led to the slaughter. And Jesus is forced to carry this cross that he's soon going to be hanging upon. He suffers emotionally. 
knowing the abandonment he'll face upon that cross. He suffers physically as his body has been ripped apart, as he has been whipped and beaten, still knowing that he's going to be nailed to this cross that he's now carrying. As he walks through the city carrying this cross, knowing that he's going to be hung up on there, that he's going to be put to shame, that, that he, he left the riches of heaven f- for this, for this plan. So they arrive at the place of the skull, Skull Hill, Golgotha, Calvary, and they lay the cross down in the dust of the earth, and they stretch out Jesus' arms. They stretch out the arms of the Messiah, man. They pull his arms out of joint, the first nail, through his wrist. They pull his second arm, stretch it out, second nail. As these nails are going through his flesh, man, the pain, the agony, saying, I'm doing it for a plan, a purpose. And they stretch out his legs and they cross him together. Third nail. The pain, the agony, knowing that, man, why is he doing this? If he's God, why can't he just snap his fingers and and get off? Why is he going through with this? The plan. He's thinking of me. He's thinking of you. He's thinking of that beautiful plan to save the world. And that worn, rugged cross, man, is pulled up. And he's there hanging on that cross. And he's hanging there. He's dying. And his mother, his friends, his his brothers, his, his followers are there watching him. And they can't do anything. Imagine seeing your son hanging there just watching, man. Can't do anything. And there's tears falling as the blood is, is falling to, to, the, to the dust. The blood of Jesus, man, falling off that cross as his mother's tears, as his mother's weeping. He's bleeding. Hanging by three nails, dying on a tree, Jesus suffered physically. Betrayed, rejected, beaten, bloody, unrecognizable, dying, suffering unlike any other. Psalm 22, verse 14 through 18, gives us some more insight to what Jesus endured on that cross. It's prophesied about the Messiah, saying, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing in order for this and other prophecies to be fulfilled. Jesus had to suffer. The third thing that we need to know about Jesus' suffering was that his suffering was spiritual. That his suffering was spiritual. As Jesus is hanging there on the cross, Jesus cries out in a loud voice. He says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you left me? Why have you left me? Why why have you abandoned me? See, God abandoned his son because Jesus had become sin for us. Sin is so disgusting to God that he couldn't even look upon his own beautiful son because his son had become sin. God had to turn away from his son on that cross because his son had become sin on our behalf. Jesus took all of the sin of the world upon his shoulders. And we can't forget that this was all part of the plan. We can't forget that this was all a part of that beautiful, crazy plan to redeem humans, to to save the world from sin. It was planned that he would be betrayed and that he would be beaten and crucified. It wasn't an accident. God did it on purpose. And so Jesus takes his last breath and he says, it it is finished. The Bible says that that he he, he lays his head down and, and gives up his spirit to God. Silence. Jesus. 
Savior of the world, dead. Jesus, Savior of the world, dead. Imagine if after your whole life, your parents just kind of said, hey, I don't really want to be with you anymore. Like, I'm just going to leave. You got you to gotta get out. Like, I can't be around you anymore. It would hurt, right? Some of you here tonight have been abandoned. You know what this feels like. Jesus knows what it feels like. He knew that this would happen, but it didn't dull the pain. He faced it head on. He faced it all head on. He stood up to the plate and said, you know what, this, this is it. I'm the only one to do this, and here I am. I'm doing it. He drank the full cup that was before him. God had to turn away from Jesus so that he wouldn't have to turn away from us. Jesus was cut so that you don't have to be cut. Jesus shed his blood so you don't have to to shed your blood as you're trying to deal with that pain and you're you're cutting your wrists and your thighs and and you're you're trying to to figure out something. You're trying to, to fill that void. Jesus faced the bitterness of death so that we don't have to. We need to realize it wasn't those nails that held Jesus to the cross. We need to realize that it was our sin that held him up there. It was our sin that held God to the cross. It was our sin that killed Jesus. Sin is terrible. Sin is destructive. Sin will take everything from you and leave you ashamed, bitter, disappointed. It will leave you always wanting more. Sin is so disgusting that Jesus came to drink the full cup of that penalty that that sin deserves. The Bible says that the wages of sin, the payment of sin is death. So Jesus came, and remember he's in the garden, he says, God, if there's any other way that, that this cup can pass from me, let it be so. But it's not my plan, it's yours. That cup that he's talking about is the full cup of God's wrath. The full payment, the full penalty of sin. And Jesus knew that he had to drink that cup so that we didn't have to. Do you know what this means? It means that everything he did, everything we've just read, everything he's ever done was for you and for me. Everything. I imagine as Jesus is hanging on that cross, he says, Peter, he says, Sarah, he says, Sam, Jenna, doing it for you. He says, Zach, just, just come to me. He says, Becca, I love you. I'm doing this for you. And he's thinking about you, man. As he's dying, he's saying, you know what? I I just want to know you. I want you to know that you're forgiven. And that I have a plan for your life. Everything he did was for you and for me. God had to treat Jesus like the worst sinner so that he could treat the worst sinner like Jesus. Jesus, the the sinless, the perfect one, became sin for us, paying our debt in full. The once and for all perfect, blameless, spotless lamb, the, the, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, took our pain, became sin, died on a cross, atoned for sin, the sacrifice once and for all, forever done. It is finished. That's what that means. That him dying means that you can have peace with God. You can say, oh, hold up. You you just told me that Jesus died, and what does some dead guy have to offer me? What if I told you that Jesus wasn't dead? The last thing we need to know about his suffering was that his suffering was made sweet. 
and suffering made sweet. After Jesus has died, he was buried in a tomb. And for three days, everything was quiet. For three days, his body lay in this tomb. But on the third day, break it down. Jesus Christ was raised to life again. On the third day, Jesus Christ was raised to life again. He, he's alive. Death cannot hold him. There's no power over Jesus that could keep him in that grave. He gets up. He says, hey, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and to take it back up again. This was my plan. Sin has no power over the name of Jesus. Death has no sting, has no victory because Jesus Christ, dying on that cross, paying the, the, the payment for our sin and rising again, put an end to sin once and for all. Once and for all. Do you realize what this means? Jesus died willingly on a cross to willingly take our sin and defeat it. He willingly came. This wasn't an accident. He chose the pain. He chose the suffering. He chose the beating. He chose the, the, the torture. He chose the abandonment. Because he wanted you to be with him forever. He bridged the gap. He opened the gates of heaven wide open. He says, whoever is thirsty, whoever is tired, come to me and you will find rest. Whoever. Whenever. Because of the cross and because of the resurrection, we can have peace with God. All you have to do is say yes. John 3, 16. says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. <laughs> Satan thought he won. He thought that he killed God. But God never loses. He always wins. And what Jesus did on that cross and what he did when he rose from the grave was put an end to sin once and for all. To make even the most bitter situation sweet. To make even the most bitter circumstance sweet. Friend, tonight. Tonight some of you need to come to know Jesus. And I'm not saying, yeah, Jesus, this is great. I'm talking about you need to give everything to him because he gave everything for you. Jesus has given us everything. Left heaven from, from riches to rags, from the crib to the cross, from the cross to the grave, from the, from the grave to life. That's what he offers us from, from death to life, from addiction to freedom. From purposelessness to, to, to purpose. To wandering, to, to being found, to, to being abused, to being restored. God's all about second chances. Trust God in your suffering. Know that he suffered for you and he died and rose again for you so that you can live. So you can have hopes that even the most bitter situation can be made sweet.